Tonight on Local Light with John Compton, Thomas and Connie Betts educate John on the finer points of raising, shearing, and working with alpacas. Connie shares the story of where these curious animals come from, and Thomas explains what it's like to work daily among the alpacas. All of that and more tonight on Local Light. Well, Thomas, Connie, thank you guys for, for coming in. It's good to have you here. I want to go like, okay, I want to just sort of get an understanding because you guys are living out in Hillsboro, is or Beaverton area, and you're both working out there. You're, you're a successful uh, sales executive mm -hmm. and, and working in the kind of corporate world sort of setting. And then you end up on a farm out in Hood River. What was life like there, and how did you, how did that transition happen? <laughs> well, that's kind of funny. Uh, I'm working for West Marine on Delta Park in Portland, and a gentleman comes in to uh, West Marine, and he comes up to me and says, I need 50 dock lines. And I said, well, how many boats do you have? And yeah. he said, I don't have boats. Said, okay, so what do you need the dock lines for? And he said, well, I have alpacas. So after that, I, I went home after work and asked Connie, he says, what's an alpaca? And her eyes got big, and, he, and first thing out of her mouth was, does he make any money doing it? And he's from Hood River, and we've always wanted to live on, that, on this side of the Cascades, because it's warmer and drier. A little bit, yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, we did a little research. I uh, actually took a couple of seminars to see what the alpacas were all about and, and how you could actually make money with them. And, so that's basically how we got started. Okay, so it's because of alpacas that you ended up in the Hood River Valley. That's right. Pretty much. All right. Well, let's go then into what is the difference between an alpaca and a llama? Because to me, I have, you know, they seem like the same, but they're very different animals, right? Correct. Yes, and that's a really common question that we're asked by our visitors all the time. Most people don't realize that alpacas and llamas are camels, and the camel family started in North America, and one branch went over to Asia and became the one hump and the two hump camel. See, I would have thought it was exactly the opposite. Yes, and one branch went down to South America, and they became the vicuña, which has some of the world's finest fiber, and the guanaco, and that animal is a little bit larger than the vicuña. And a long time ago, the Incas took the guanaco and created the llama for packing and for guarding. So we have a llama named Titan who guards one of our pastures and our pregnant female alpacas. And then they took the vicuña and created the alpaca for its very fine fiber. And so llamas, are, are they sheared and is, is their fiber used or is it not really usable? They were not intended to be a fiber animal. Okay. They were intended to be used for packing. People take them on treks um, and also for guarding other livestock. That was their intention. However, some of the llamas do have pretty nice fiber and our Titan actually has gorgeous fiber and we sell his fiber as well. Uh-huh. Guarding. Yes. I wouldn't think of these animals as guard animals. Yes, well the llama now is the size of a small horse and they are very alert and attentive. They're always watching. Generally you'll see them at the edges of the herd with uh, the herd, they'll be on the edge, then they'll be the herd and then maybe the barn. So that if they need to, they can give out a warning call and all the alpacas will go in the barn. They'll, they'll even um, kick and attack a predator Really? Yes. So Have you guys witnessed that firsthand? No, but no. our neighbor Susan said that before she got her guard llama, that her very old sheep, she has some geriatric sheep, they, had, they were attacked all the time, split ears, broken legs, all kinds of things. Once she got her guard llama, and his name is Kool-Aid, <laughs> she says she's never had another problem, and she knows that he fought off a cougar once and saved a sheep. Really? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. 
that really is amazing to me. Well, those Incas knew what they were doing I when guess they so. created them as guard and pack animals. Yeah, yes. yeah. And then the beautiful alpacas. Right. So their fibers, and I know that we'll get into some of the s stuff that you guys actually make and sell and all of that in a bit, but um, s I mean, it is, it's so soft. It's so, and it's, it, it wicks water, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. And it's very, so it's actually very durable and it can be used in all kinds of things, which I guess we'll talk about a bit. But alpacas are not bred in the U.S. anymore or they are bred, but they cannot be imported. Something with that, what was that about? Well, in 1982, they were brought in the United States. Um, and at that point, uh, they brought in enough to make sure that they didn't have, uh, uh, what's the word? Too small of a breeding too, pool. Yeah, too small of a breeding pool. And then in 1998, they stopped importing them. And they had enough here to do what we needed to do. And we do what we, here in the United States, we do what they call selective breeding. So we'll take a, a, a female and she might have really nice fiber, but maybe she needs a little bit more uh, structure, uh, confirmation. And so you get a stud that is perfect. You know, he's got good confirmation, he's got nice fiber, and we'll breed that male to that female. And then the offspring will be better than the, than the mother, the, the al, uh, female alpaca. Mm -hmm. And so you keep doing this stair-stepping and improving the quality of the fiber through our, every generation. So you actually start creating more and more superior animals. Correct. Yes, and to get back to your question, if we continue to import animals from foreign countries and we don't know what their background is and what their genetics are and what they're capable of, if we don't track their bloodlines, then it's much more difficult to do the selective breeding that Thomas was talking about. So by closing the U.S. to imports, and we actually do uh, DNA testing to confirm who the dam and the sire are. We produce the pedigrees, and so we know you know, we know what the best herd sires are in the U.S. We can see those in the bloodlines. That's how we can so dramatically improve the alpacas with every generation. So it's extremely documented. Yes. yes. And controlled. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Well, when we come back from the break, I want to talk obviously more about this. I want to see some of the products that you guys make. And again, I still want to understand going from, from the life that you were living out in uh, the Willamette Valley to, to, to being full-time farmers and what that looks like and, and how well you guys have transitioned because I understand there's been some pretty big attention that you guys have garnered. So we'll talk about some of those things when we come back. Be right back. Coming up, we have wakayas on our ranch and they have a crimpy fiber. There's crimp in the fiber and that causes it to stand out from their bodies and look kind of like teddy bears. They look like teddy bears walking around in the field.